basically what my dad did is after he told me what to say, all that kind of stuff, he dropped me off at a subdivision for basically there must have been 300 houses. And he said, listen, I want you to knock on every single door and give them the opportunity to help your hockey team by buying this fertilizer. I am Pete Gilfillan, and I'm joined each week with my fellow franchise consultant, Nat Truitt. And this is the Hire Yourself podcast, a twice weekly series that explores franchises and business. We will publish a long episode each Monday that intensely focuses on a topic that will help franchisees and business owners succeed and live life on their own terms. Each Thursday, we'll present a shorter episode about a different, lighter topic. Nat and I have over 70 years of combined experience in franchising and business to share with you to help you realize your dreams and control your own destiny. We have a great topic to discuss for this episode. We get questions all the time whether or not franchisees need sales experience to be successful. And so this episode, we're going to talk about whether or not it is truly needed. That's awesome, Pete. So I, you know, I've been getting asked a lot about, you know, whether or not someone needs sales experience. Like what is, what are kind of some of your thoughts about that? You know, when we think about sales, uh, sales experience, uh, I work with engineers and I, I worked with a pastor the other day. And, and I got to tell you that it's not necessary to have sales experience. Now, you have to be open to talking to people, right? So if you're not willing to talk to people, then you're in trouble. But if you're willing to talk and listen and learn about people, then you don't necessarily need sales experience because franchising has so much to offer when it comes to helping people with sales. Yeah, I think a lot about franchising. I kind of feel like, you know, part of the value proposition is, you know, you're getting a proven product or service, but you're also getting a proven sales and marketing strategy. And then you're kind of like gas in the engine. You're, you're what makes it go ultimately. I do think people that have successful track records or kind of, you know, like being around people or building relationships or building a team, I think that definitely is going to kind of tip the scales in their their favor of being successful. But there's so many different models. You know, you and I were just talking the other day about how with the uh, brick and mortar or more facility based, you know, customers come to you and then you kind of scale up by opening up more locations and then kind of the, I call it like field based service type franchises. So you might have like with my background in senior care, you know, we had caregivers that actually went to people's houses to provide the services. So there's all sorts of kind of like that distributed service model where you actually end up hiring salespeople to kind of scale up and grow. So it's, you know, it's kind of interesting. I like trying to help people get up to speed and learn a little bit about the different models as we're working together. Yeah, I don't think anybody likes to do cold calling, Nat. And then what I tell people is, is that with cold calling or, you know, door-to-door sales, no, nobody really truly enjoys that. And, and I've done it, so I understand it. But I think when I look at franchising and I work with people, I tell them, listen, there are three types of sales uh, in the simplest form, right? So there are facility-based franchises where somebody, the customer literally walks through door and all you have to do is take care of them, right? They have a need or want. So they want to get a haircut. They want to get a great sub sandwich. They want to take a Pilates class. They want a massage. And and so you just got to take care of them, right? And there is, we'll call service-based franchises where they go to people's homes, right? So literally the customer calls you and says, hey, please come to our house. We have a need or want, or they contact you to the website and, and your team member shows up and it's not door-to-door sales. Your team member shows up and the homeowner goes, you know what? We need a new closet or we would like our carpet exchange. We want to paint the inside of our house gray or we want our windows to be cleaner or our front grass to look greener. In all cases, the idea behind it is that you're going to the customer. They've invited you to come there. And then there's business, right? B2B, where you're going to businesses and you're helping the business owners with a product or service. A a simple example would be that restaurant down the street has oven hoods. Those oven hoods have to be cleaned out on a quarterly basis. So the business calls you and says, hey, listen, we we need these oven hoods cleaned out. We have to have that done on a quarterly basis and your company could do it. Or, Or it could be that small business down the street that they have IT needs, IT service needs, but they're too small to have their own IT department and they would have to hire a company like that. So in in most cases, you're really not doing kind of cold calling unless you want to from that standpoint. Yeah, I love how you kind of were talking about some some franchise categories. People might not have even realized it because it's so amazing. There's over 4,000 franchises out there and so many, there's about 1,100 service-based franchises. 
And a lot of people don't even realize because they don't have that physical location on the corner of Maine and Maine. So you don't realize like there's franchises that clean hood vents and, and things like that. There's so many layers of the onion as you're kind of learning about it. Absolutely. And you know, you invested in your first franchise at a young age, right? And did you have sales experience and, or did the franchisor teach you about sales when you invested in that franchise? Yeah, that was kind of an interesting story. I was 29 years old. I kind of went through the process of learning about the franchise, going to Discovery Day and decided, wow, I'm, you know, I was so impressed with the parent company. Signed my franchise agreement, wired my money. And then I went to a week of training in uh, Dayton, Ohio. And the training actually really got me up to speed as a 29 year old. You know, you're wearing a lot of different hats. But, you know, they really impressed on me that, you know, nothing happens until I go and sell something. So especially when you're starting your business and it's a service-based business. And so you're kind of behind the scenes. You don't have that, you know, like I said earlier, the sign on the corner of Maine and Maine. You have to let people know that you're in business. So I went to corporate for training, came back. You know, the nice thing about that is, again, you know, like I said earlier, you have the proven product or service, but also the proven sales and marketing. So there'd been a hundred other franchise owners that kind of blazed the path ahead. So whether that's with proven trifold brochures or proven in-services or, you know, all this different content. Back in the day, it wasn't the intranet, you know, now it's just Google Drive or, or Dropbox. But he had this uh, toolbox of all, all the tools and marketing materials and everything. And they also helped kind of come up with a uh, marketing plan over the first 90 days, kind of that grand opening push and all that. And uh, I just remembered, you know, it's so interesting and just meeting so many different people and actually having a reason to go talk to people and building relationships. And now today it's kind of funny. I have um, some salespeople there. <laughs> it seems like they're like, they come back to the office and they're like, wherever we go, we run into somebody that knows Nat. And so it's kind of funny because I'm like, yeah, because back in 2001, I was out there talking to everybody. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, you know, your background a little different. You, you invest in your franchise at a kind of a younger age and that's where they kind of taught you about sales. You know, as I uh, grew up with as a professional career, I was with Ford, right? And they taught us a lot about selling because we were selling cars to car dealers. If you can imagine that uh, we would sell them the wholesale or the product that they have on their, on their lots. And so they had a very formal sales process and they taught us how to do that. And, and it was uh, very good. But when I invested in my first franchise, a little bit older than you were, you would invest in yours, Nat. But, but the idea was, is that I also went to training and they had a uh, specific uh, training that taught us a little bit about their sales process as well as their systems. And I, I remember I invested in a junk rule franchise. And so they took me to a warehouse and I had no experience with junk or anything else like that. And I had to put together an estimate of how much it would cost to haul away or how much to charge to haul away all the junk from this warehouse. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a great experience, but it was some great skills that they, they shared with me or taught me as the franchisee in terms of the sales as well as the sales process. It's interesting that you and I both kind of have that service-based background. What have you seen, like some of the people you've been working with, with kind of more of the, the brick and mortar? Like, what do you see that kind of their backgrounds have been? The nature of service-based franchises is one thing. When we start talking about facility-based concepts, people really like facility-based concepts because this idea is the customer literally walks through the door and all you have to do is take care of them. So it, in many cases, it's just an easier type of sales because you're not having to go to the customer, the customer's coming to you. Now, with that, uh, the franchises, they have very specific processes in regards to how to handle those customers. And so uh, a lot of times I'll be talking to people and they'll say, yeah, so the customer comes th through the door and then what do we do? And that's the benefit of a franchise is they've got the sales process. And we'll use a great example of uh, a Pilates franchise, right? So I go through, I see an ad to take a free class, Pilates class, and I show up and I take this great Pilates class. I have this great experience. And when I'm done with that class, I get to talk to one of the salespeople. It's a counter person, but the counter person job is to sign me up to be a member. And the franchise system has got a set process in which that counter person helps or basically signs me up to become a member, which is the ultimate goal of their, their sales process. And so it's a different type of sales where the customer comes to you, but you also have to be able to have a very good understanding of what their needs or wants are and fulfill that with your product or service. In this case, it would be an awesome Pilates workout. 
Yeah, I do feel like at the end of the day, nothing happens until somebody sells something somewhere. The nice thing with the franchise is they've created essentially what you might call like an irresistible offer, right? So kind of, you know, whether it's platies and you, you're like, oh my God, this is so great. And then they crafted this tested offer that they know that converts and people will join and become members and all that. The other thing that I think people, you know, a lot of times I hear, oh, you know, it's so competitive, whether it's Pilates, or, you know, uh, fitness or painting or whatever. I think a lot, one thing that a lot of people don't realize, and it's, you know, somewhat of the secret sauce of franchising is they just deploy so much more resources into sales and marketing and specifically into marketing, which is a little bit more that front end of the funnel. So for example, I know sport clips, I believe the franchisor requires that the local offices invest a little over a thousand dollars a week into local marketing. And when you think about that, compare that to like your main street barbershop guy, you know, I know our guys, you know, they sponsor little league teams and stuff like that, but they probably spend up 50 to a hundred dollars a month sponsoring. Whereas like sports clips is blasting through two, three, four thousand dollars a month, which opens up that front end of the funnel. And again, going back to a little bit earlier, the franchisor has tested all this stuff. They know that it'll convert into a certain amount of revenue. And then that's how franchise unit locations are able to kind of dominate market share and continue to grow. And, you know, franchising a lot of times is a consolidation of a mom and pop industry. And a lot of times it it is because the systems, the processes, and also the sales and marketing engine behind it. What I think the benefit of a franchise is that if your sales, for example, your sales closing ratio isn't working, the benefit of the franchise is that you can go back to the franchisor and ask for help or have them help you become better at your closing ratio. Take a look at what you guys are doing, your team's doing, and and help evaluate and figure it out. And you also have that whole network of other franchisees. So there's some real benefits when it comes to sales, is that if you're not getting the job done, you're not performing at the right level, you can kind of lean on that franchisor to give you more training or to evaluate your process to see what you're doing right or wrong. And you can leverage other franchisees. So it's kind of a win-win for everybody when it comes to franchising and business development or sales. Yeah, as you were kind of talking about that, I was kind of remembering, because you and I are kind of competitive. In a franchise, like when I started, you know, you have like this owner's group, and then all the KPIs are rolling up to the parent company or to the franchisor. And so you are able to benchmark yourself against all other locations. And I remember it would get pretty competitive because all the you know franchise owners, it was just kind of good fun. But, you know, everybody wants to be number one, right? So we'd all be you know, trying to figure out like how to grow our sales. And then also you kind of know where you are in the system too. So if you're in the top third or middle third or bottom third, it can be a really fun environment. And then also to your point, you can get help if you need help. Most franchises eventually, maybe not early on, but eventually they'll have regional support people that will come on location and kind of help you. You know, the thing about franchising is your interests are aligned. So they want you to grow your revenue because they make more money when you make more money. So that's kind of like that rising tide raises all ships. So everybody's kind of going the same direction, trying to help more, more people have more customers and grow the business or grow the system together. You know, one of the things when I talk to people and they say, listen, I, I don't have any sales experience. I, I don't know if I can invest in a franchise. You know, I tell them when we talk about sales or business development, we're always selling in life. We're selling product services, budgets, proposals. Heck, I had to sell my wife on marrying me, right? <laughs> life is about selling. And, and we're always we're always trying to sell something from a standpoint. And, and sales in many ways now is, uh, it's not a very sexy word, right? Uh, sales. Uh, A lot of times now that we'll use a little bit more sophisticated word like business development and things like that. Again, all sales or business development is, is really this idea of listening to the customer to learn about their needs or wants and offering a solution with your product or services. That's as simple. Whatever term you want to put on it, that is business development sales. Yeah, totally. And I think, you know, there's just different levers in franchising. So if somebody is a little bit light on the net net worth or working capital, they can do a business that requires a little bit more elbow grease or, you know, basically them going out and building the business. If they have a little higher net worth or they want to put their money to work, have a little bit more of an executive run business on that sliding scale, you're putting your money to work and then you're not having to do quite as much of that sales activity typically. Yeah. So that's why I like love kind of learning about people's backgrounds and what they're interested in doing for this next chapter of their life. 
and then going and finding franchises that would be a perfect fit for them. Now, what about this idea that, I, hey, listen, I, if, if I don't want to do sales, I can just hire somebody to do the sales. I mean, I, I know with your current, one of your other businesses, you have to hire salespeople all the time. So tell me a little bit about kind of hiring uh, away from your, your weakness, right? So if, if, if sales isn't your deal, can you go hire salespeople to kind of solve that for you? Yeah. So I'm not going to lie to you, Pete. It's not super easy either way. It's a, it's a very much a human business or a people business. And sales people is definitely the way to scale your service-based business. I think you have to find the right person, come up with the right compensation plan, and keep them long-term. I personally, I kind of like the concept or the strategy of doing a lot like with the senior care business, I call that a run for mayor type business. For the first three years, you're really kind of kissing babies and shaking hands. And then everybody knows you. And then as you kind of want to expand to a little larger geography, you have the ability or capacity to handle more clients. You have to start bringing on more salespeople. And then like for me, I started transitioning out of kind of that day-to-day sales role and kind of men- mentored some salespeople. So I've had some great salespeople and I've had some not so great salespeople. I think it's just, it takes a little bit of time and and mentoring for that. And ultimately, you know, the nice thing about that is it's still going to be way cheaper typically than opening up more brick and mortar locations to scale up by hiring salespeople. But you need salespeople for a facility-based concept too, right? In all cases, if you're not there or you don't want to do it, you're having salespeople. So there's no, no question about that. You know, when we talk about salespeople or being good at sales, some people say uh, that's a born salesperson, right? What do you think about that? I think it's more of a, a learned skill like public speaking uh, than it is you're born with this ability to sell. I kind of agree with that. I think that people usually kind of sniff out a salesperson. In this day and age, transparency is so important. I think being sincere being cause based, like, you know, kind of mission based with your, your business and trying to help people. I think that that actually resonates better with people just being authentic and being there for the long term too. You know, I, I've worked with quite a few people in the past that were relocating to different geographies and actually they ended up investing in like a service based business. And what they liked about it was it gave them a reason or opportunity to go talk to people in their new community where they were moving and build those relationships. I think that you can, the franchise or like in my case, right, 29 year old, they taught me how to basically be a sales person and in a very competitive and tough environment, which is healthcare or home healthcare. I like the fact that the franchise or can teach you. And I also think that if you're just yourself and genuine and willing to do the activity, a lot of times you'll, you'll be very successful. So now I told you my dad was a car dealer and so the, the ultimate salesman. And, uh, when I was, I, and I'm not kidding you, fourth grade, what is that? Eight years old, nine years old, something like that. My hockey team had a fundraiser. We were to sell fertilizer, right? And so my dad basically helped me write a little script from a standpoint so that when I approached doors, I would have a specific thing to say. He taught me how to stand at that front door where I could stand sideways, not facing it. So made myself kind of a little bit more friendly from that standpoint, stand back further enough. And in basically what my dad did is after he told me what to say, all that kind of stuff, uh, I had my little sheet and, and how to stand. He dropped me off at a subdivision for basically there must have been 300 houses. And he said, listen. I want you to knock on every single door and give them the opportunity to help your hockey team by buying this fertilizer. And I'm going to come back in two hours. I'm not going to follow you around with the car. I'm going to leave. I will be back in two hours, but I want you to to knock on every single door. (laughs) So that was my introduction to uh, sales or business development at, at a very early age, but it was a great experience. Yeah, it's interesting. Some of those early experiences make a big impression on us. It's as you were saying that I was just remembering I was out with my son about, I say about a month ago, and we were they were for Boy Scouts, they're selling Christmas wreaths. And he has this one, you know, quote, unquote, account, which is this huge house, and they usually buy a couple hundred dollars worth of wreaths. So he was all excited, had his uniform on and everything and goes up to the door knocks. They come to the door. He's like, Oh, hey, you know, Gave, gave his pitch and they said, well, we already bought 
all of our Christmas wreaths and roping and everything. So he came back a little bit disappointed. And so I said, well, all right, what we're going to do is we're going to just go to the next house and then we're going to go to the next house and we're going to go to all these houses. So it was actually kind of a fun day because, you know, we went to a couple houses, got some rejection, kind of worked through that. And then also hit, got some good sales. He hit his quota and then he was like thinking he was done. And I was like, you know what, we we have to walk home anyways. Let's just go ahead and knock on all the doors on our way home. It's just fun to kind of pass that down to our, our kids too. You know, that's part of what I like about franchising and entrepreneurship too. It just gives us the opportunity to, to teach our kids and lead by example and pass it on to the next generation. Yeah. And there's some great resources in terms of business development, whether you want to take classes, seminars, and there's also some great books out there. Uh, you know, I grew up reading the, you know, the Zig Ziglar, or the Brian Tracy books on, on sales. And so uh, ultimately there's, there's many, many resources when you go into it. But as we think about sales and business development, do you have to have those skills when you go into uh, investing in a franchise? Absolutely not. Do you have to have the willingness to talk to people to learn about their needs or wants and then providing your superior product or service? Absolutely. Do franchises give you that backdrop to one train you as well as give you the uh, systems, the processes and the support to, to be successful? Absolutely. So when we look at sales and business development with franchising, you don't need the skills. You can certainly learn those because we all can learn and you can leverage salespeople, you can leverage training, you can leverage all the other resources. So what we talked about franchising, I don't necessarily believe you need to have that, that experience. It, it's something you can learn. It's awesome. Pete, what do you think about for our next episode on Thursday? We talk a little bit more about how our dads have influenced and shaped our lives. Great. Let's do it. All right. So thanks for joining us today. If you enjoyed our podcast, please subscribe, give us a rating and leave a comment. You can also follow us on LinkedIn at Hire Yourself and on Facebook at Hire Yourself CO. Also, we have great resources on our blog at hireyourself.com. And we look forward to you joining us again.